Okay. We know from previous lessons um, that the trade guilds were very important, and if you were going to make a living, you had to be engaged in the trade guilds, but the trade guilds were also full of um, idolatry and um, uh, emperor worship and uh, ungodly worship and ungodly behavior, and so Christians were pretty much left out uh, in left field commercially and the ability to make money. So the uh, two primary or two of the primary industries in Thyatira that may be referenced here as Jesus speaks to this church uh, is the dye industry. They made purple dye. Now when I talk about purple dye, does that remind you of anybody in the New Testament? Yes. Lydia, yes. who was at Philippi mm -hmm. and was a convert. Um, and if you remember, if I've got the account right, um, you couldn't have a synagogue unless there were ten men. But you could have a small cottage prayer group. And Lydia had a prayer group and um, is thought to be, since, since she was mentioned and she was a, a, a dealer in purple dye, she may have been from Thyatira and may have been instrumental in establishing the church there at Thyatira under Paul's influence. So that's just a conjecture. The other thing that was popular in Thyatira was the making of pottery. And so um, we may have an allusion to that later as Jesus speaks to the church. Write to the angel of the church in Thyatira, thus says the Son of God. You'll notice that Jesus refers to himself as the Son of God instead of the Son of Man. And as I've t uh, told you, I think every Sunday there are uh, hundreds of different ways of referring to Jesus. His uh, preferred method of referring to himself was Son of Man. But here he's really stressing his deity, the Son of God, we think. Uh, the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame. Now remember when we talked about the reality that there is much symbolism in the book of Revelation, much of that symbolism is very clear and explained in the context. So we understand that, um, that when we see the word like, like a fiery flame, and whose feet are like fine bronze, that they're not literally fine bronze or literally flame, but the characteristics of those things, the the um, heat-seeking, the laser-like vision, the all-knowing, the powerful sight uh, that Jesus has in his omniscience, and the, the toughness of bronze and the heaviness of bronze and the weightiness of bronze and the purity of bronze when we talk about his feet. Anybody ever have a job where you had to wear steel-toed boots? All right, those are pretty important to you, aren't they? All right. How many of you still have all your toes? Well, there you go. Um, so when we think about heavy footwear, when we think about um, stomping things out and having protection. So uh, there again, the, the symbolism is not too deep there. I know your works, or Jesus knows our works, your love, faithfulness, service, and endurance. And I know that your last works are greater than the first. So this is a great commendation. Uh, I know your works, all these good things, and that you're getting better. You're improving all the time. Your, your most recent efforts are more impressive than your first efforts. So it's a great encouragement for us to continue to grow in the way that we serve, uh, love, our faithfulness, our faithful, our faithful and in our endurance. But I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and deceives my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Mm -hmm. Now, probably the last time you heard of Jezebel was back in um, the book of Kings, 1 Kings, I think, and you remember that she was an imported queen that was married to Ahab. Mm -hmm. um, and Ahab was just a quizzling, wimpy, weak um, king who only did what Jezebel influenced him to do. So Jezebel, this, I doubt that this lady at Thyatira uh, was named Jezebel, because who would name their kid Jezebel? I'm sorry, anybody have a relative named Jezebel? <laughs> um, because Jezebel was a notoriously wicked character. 
She used her influence to uh, undermine the uh, godly religion of the Israelites. Uh, she opposed, of course, you remember the, the prophet. Uh, she imported prophets of Baal. She encouraged idol worship and all of the uh, sexual immorality that went along with that. And so she was just a wicked woman of influence. And uh, we don't know how she wormed her way into this church. Uh, nobody could get away with just walking into the church brazenly and starting to preach a whole new um, interpretation of Christianity uh, and becoming a person of influence. So uh, it, the implication is, or at least what I would surmise, is that started out just a normal, you know, somebody might have been a little quirky, might have had some odd ideas, but everybody, because they were Christians, they just wanted to be nice, and, and they went along with stuff, and eventually she became a person of influence in a very uh, wicked way. And the church was tolerating it. There were certain members within the church at Thyatira that were not only tolerating that, but were buying into her bad theology and her bad behavior. Now, it says who calls herself a prophetess um, and teaches. Now, we continue in evangelical churches to fuss and fight about the role of women in the church. All right? um, it is clear in the Bible that there were women who were deacons, deaconesses. It is also clear that there were prophetesses uh, in the New Testament. So when, they, when Jesus uses the words prophetess, He's not saying that there's no such thing. He's saying that she declared herself to have that office and have that gift, uh, and she did not, in fact. And she was teaching. Um, folks, we, we are careful in this church about who teaches within the church body. Right? That's why we have a little bit of a vetting of membership. Um, and we have people that prove themselves and prove their maturity and their uh, Christ-like walk before we allow them to teach. And that may keep some uh, people out of being involved uh, in a way that they'd like to be involved, but that is the lesser danger than the danger of having somebody uh, teaching false doctrine from a position of authority mm -hmm. and expecting to be believed. So what failed to happen in this church in Thyatira is that they failed to hold this teaching accountable to what was known uh, in the uh, scripture and the apostolic teaching at the time. And as I have encouraged you um, to, uh, to never completely accept what I say from the pulpit just because I happen to be here, um, that everything that I say must be measured against Scripture. They failed to do this with the woman Jezebel. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. The age of grace that we are in will never completely end because God will always give people plenty of opportunity to repent and change their ways. As we move through this book, we'll see that we move away from an age of grace into a time of a punishment of wickedness. But even within that is the message, I am God, I want you to recognize that I am God, and I am asking you to repent of your sin, which rebellious uh, people do not. During the tribulation, of course we'll talk a lot about the tribulation, I am one who holds to the understanding that the Christians will not be, um, that they'll be raptured before the tribulation. Not everybody agrees with me. People of good conscience, people, other scholars uh, have uh, believed that Christians will go through the tribulation, that the rapture is at some other sequence. I, I don't have the time or interest to argue about that. But I do know that there will be people saved during the tribulation time. People who look at God's wrath being poured out and recognize that he is God, they are not, and they need to submit to him, and they give their lives to him. And those are the tribulation saints that we'll be studying about. So um, he, she doesn't, he, God doesn't immediately uh, punish 
Jezebel, but says, I'm going to give you time to repent, but she has failed to repent. Unless, uh, look, I will throw her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery uh, with her into great affliction. Now, we think about bedrooms associated with uh, sexual immorality as well as uh, God-ordained sexuality, but here apparently Jesus is saying, you want to be in bed, I'll put you in bed. And not in a good way. Great affliction. Unless they repent of her works, I will strike her children dead. Now, I I, I choose to have the same understanding as several commentators that 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 means followers. Not that he's going to, that God says, okay, if you get pregnant and all this immorality, I'm going to kill your kids. Um, I'm not seeing that here, although God certainly would have the right to do that. Um, But followers. Um, then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you according to your works. <clears throat> Do you think God might choose to end the life of a, uh, an apostate believer or uh, someone who pretends to be an, a believer and is not? Well, this tells us yes. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So... Um, We love God. We know that he's uh, gracious. We know that we can come to him and repent of our sins. But we also know that he's no respecter of person. And if we think that because we're good Christians and trying to do the right thing or going to church on a regular basis or serving in a regular way, that we can step out of bounds and follow our own sinful passions without being accountable because God loves us so much and he's going to forgive us, He will forgive us, but he's not going to take away the natural consequences of your sin. He's not going to necessarily say, well, I'm going to to let you hide that sin because I want you to continue to be a witness for me, whether hypocritical or not. So there's a little bit of fear and trembling that needs to go into our reading of this passage uh, as we understand God's uh, ability to deal with this. I say to the rest of you in Thyatira... uh, who do not hold to this teaching, who haven't known the so-called secrets of Satan, as they say, I'm not putting any other burden on you. So Jesus recognizes that there is a cluster of really sick church people in Thyatira, but there are other people that are trying to do their best and continue to be faithful to him and to uh, living a Christ-like life. And so he's, 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 I'm not going to put any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. I've never been a gym rat, as you could probably tell. But there are times in my life when I thought, man, I really need to get into shape. Um, but I don't want to go to the gym until I get in shape. Right? Because I don't want all those other people to see me doing that. You know? Um Kind of like the people who hire a housekeeper and they have to clean before they come. Right? Uh, Jesus just saying, look, you're at this level. You're doing good if you stay at this level. All right. So for, for, for those of us that may be, uh, oh, I wish I knew the Bible more. I wish I could witness more. I wish I was a better Christian. I wish I was more disciplined in my prayer life. Um, yeah, all those things are good goals. Uh, to discipline and to study and to improve, but you're doing well if you if you if you do what you know to do. All right, you probably heard the story of the farmer that was out plowing in the field, and the brand new, uh, fresh out of college agricultural agent came by and said, "Hey, hey, buddy, I can tell you how to farm uh, a lot more efficiently." And he says, "I ain't farming half as good as I know right now." <laughs> so so keep doing what you do know to do. Right? Keep that level at least and don't slip back. And uh, Jesus is very gracious to them. The one who conquers and who keeps my works to the end, I will give him authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will shatter them like pottery. The reason I mentioned that pottery was a, um, a, a craft that was important in Thyatira, we kind of understand what, a, what an iron scepter is. I mean, it's as opposed to a... Uh, a, a wooden symbolic scepter uh, or the, the shepherd's crook. This iron rod is one that was a weapon. And one of the jobs, I'm told, by at least one commentator, 
was that there were people that were hired to uh, collect all of the bad pottery that didn't meet standards and there didn't come out right, didn't come out straight, the wrong color or something. And you don't want Thyatira and pottery going out into the marketplace if it's not the absolute best to maintain the reputation of the of the pottery, right? And so they would hire somebody, one of the one of the things, one of the jobs that was available, non-skilled labor, is to take an iron rod and shatter all those uh, pieces of pottery that did not live up to standards. And so that that has some, whether we're reading that into this passage, but since Jesus knows these people, knows where they are, knows what they're going to relate to, it's very possible that, that the Lord is saying, uh, look, this, this iron rod that you're used to seeing people destroy inadequate, uh, defective pottery with, that's the kind of rod that I'm going to bring against those that continue to be disobedient. Does that make sense? Yeah. We'll shatter them like pottery. Mm-hmm. Just as I have received this from my father, I also give him the morning star. A lot of debate about what that morning star means. Um, I had seen lots of sunrises, not because I get up early, but because I have worked lots of midnight shifts. Um, and I guess I've never really noticed it carefully enough, but apparently there's the final star before the light gets completely light. There's that bright and morning star that remains when all of the other stars disappear, and uh, I kind of like that um, definition of the morning star. Let anyone who has ears hear, listen to the, what's, what the Spirit says to the churches, and so... As he does in each of the letters, uh, he's always saying, anybody that listens to this, right, is going to be blessed. That was the promise of the first chapter, and that this is a teaching for all the churches. So one of the things that I wanted to do today was to talk about what I see as two major themes in this particular letter, and one is sound theology and the other is godly relationships. So we're going to talk about that. Um, and I, I want to be careful when I stand here and I teach out of here that the truth comes from here and not from here. All right. So I'm going to share some things that I think are, um, are wise, but then I'm going to talk about clearly biblical principles. All right. So... Um, I, I'm not going to say that the things that are not Bible quotes, um, I, I'm not claiming that that's a holy revelation or that I am uh, teaching you how to live your best life now or, or any of these uh, character improvement, personality improvement, healthy, wealthy, uh, gospel kinds of uh, psychobabble kinds of uh, preaching, right? So I, I just I want to I be careful about that, so so take this as you will. But the, one of the first things I want to talk about is this uh, issue of um, theology. And so here's some here's some human wisdom. Do not rely on a charismatic personality to be a sign of truth. I suspect that this Jezebel, whoever she was, was a pretty dynamic person, and it might have been one of these subtly influential. You know how some people kind of. Uh, they, they, they're kind of under the radar, but they have a lot of influence with people. Uh, or she may have had some, may have had a great personality, and we tend to think, man, if somebody's that dynamic and somebody's that uh, sure of themselves and somebody that can, can quote scripture so so confidently out of context, that that maybe they're being blessed by God. Um, that is not a one-to-one ratio. So be careful about personalities being associated with Biblical Truth, capital T, right? So um, when you listen to a preacher on the radio or when you, when you watch a preacher on TV or YouTube, be, you know, if they're an engaging speaker, that's wonderful, and that's a giftedness that they have. Um, but the uh, skill that they have in the pulpit, the skill that they have in storytelling or that, that uh, funny accent that they have, uh, that's so engaging. That that does not speak of truth. Only truth speaks of truth. Yeah, I don't need to be, beat that to death. There are no new revelations about the character of God or his essential truths. 
Nothing to be added or subtracted. This is the warning that's given to us in the final chapter of the book of Revelation. Now, do we discover new uh, understandings? Do we have new revelations about how God is dealing with our life? Um, I, I, I know a, a pastor who I respect for the most part, but he, he has implied through some postings I've seen that, he, that he's done that nobody has any kind of revelation today. And as an illustration, he showed a video of a well-known um, uh, teacher um, who was sharing this testimony that he heard a young man speaking, and he was the, the young man was kind of faltering. It was kind of one of his first opportunities to speak in front of a crowd. And so um, this well-known teacher went up to him later and, and said, I just feel like in my spirit that God is preparing you for the pastoral ministry, and I just wanted to encourage you. And so my pastor friend mocked that, saying, there are no new revelations. I disagree with him, because my question, I wanted to ask him, I'm not going to confront him about it, because we're still friends, but I want to say, um, what made you decide to be a pastor? Was that not a revelation from God? Does God not speak today? Does God not use circumstances and and uh, wise counselors, and moments of meditation and prayer, perhaps even dreams, perhaps even visions. Does he not deal with anybody like that anymore? God can do whatever he wants to do, but man will not discover anything new that has not yet been revealed in this scripture. This is all the truth God wants us to know. And it's all the truth that we need. So... When you see some movement that blossomed in the 1800s or the 1900s and, oh, this is a new way that's finally revealed, uh, here's a new book that we found, here's a new way to interpret Scripture, that, my friends, is not Truth with a capital T. Yeah, so reject it. Reject it. So again, use your discernment. Your primary teacher is God's Holy Spirit. Yeah. He wrote the book. He can best explain the book. And so um, we, we can, I, 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 stu- I love studying. I love that I have to study because that, that makes me study to, to get ready for Sundays. And I often, as, uh, as I sit in my office at home or on the deck uh, in, in, uh, on, on sunny days, um, I'm often just inspired. I, I'm just like, wow, I can't, you know, that's amazing. I never thought about that. So we get new understandings, new depths of understanding, but we need to be careful to understand that there's no new truth with a capital T. You may just recognize some truth that's been there all of these centuries. So God doesn't need anybody to be a prophet of some new special revelation. Mm -hmm. Because he's accomplished all that. Mm -hmm. He's accomplished all. And and if somebody says, well, this is something most people don't understand, that da, 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 just be very careful, right? And it it is tempting. I know as a speaker, I hesitate to call myself a preacher. I'm I'm, I'm still nervous about that. Uh, But as, as as a speaker... When I look at these passages particularly, and I know all of you have had sermons on the seven churches of Revelation. This is probably the tenth study if you've been a lifelong church member. Uh, hopefully you've had been under the teaching of, of the book of Revelation. At least the, uh, a lot of preachers will talk about the seven churches, and that's all the Revelation they, they talk about. Um, but there's a real temptation. To, I'm going to find some kind of nugget or some kind of truth or some kind of interpretation of the Hebrew word or the Greek text or uh, historical fact. I'm going, to, I'm going to give these people something new. And so sometimes we generate stuff that really doesn't belong under the umbrella of truth. And I try to tell you when I'm conjecturing, when I'm imagining, and when I'm uh, kind of uh, making some uh, uh, assumptions. I hope that I make that clear. But um, I'm not going to claim to have any special knowledge. One of the things that is a characteristic of Gnosticism, which was probably part of Jezebel's teaching, Gnosticism essentially says, if I understand the basics of it, is that there's the spiritual and the physical. And the spiritual and the physical are not connected. So it doesn't matter what I do in my physical body 
because it's not spiritual. So somebody can say, I can get involved in these uh, immoral activities that Jezebel is encouraging because it doesn't affect my spirituality because there's a, a, a diversity, a diversion, a bifurcation mm -hmm. between the spiritual and the physical, right? I talked about this um, a while back when we were talking about the altar and the and the fellow that tried to keep the altar from from falling over and he was struck dead. We talked about holiness um, and how we often think about um, things that are uh, that are sacred and things that are not sacred. And in the Christian life, there's not that split between the sacred and the secular. Right? Your work, whatever it be is sacred. Your relationships, whatever they be, uh, is under the realm of sacred. Because the Holy Spirit lives within us. That's the uh, temple of the Holy Spirit that we've given our bodies as well as our souls to the Lord. We belong to Him lock, stock, and barrel so that everything should be an expression of God's goodness and holiness in us. And um, so that, that belies the... Uh, the, the uh, teaching of Gnosticism, but one of the other parts of Gnosticism is that you'll have these vibrations or these these, these special insights or these special moments um, of intuition to discover some new truth. And folks, is that not the world's religion when you look at people who are worshiping uh, through astrology and through uh, uh, paganism and nature and looking for the God within and trying to find out what the universe is giving to me. They're all looking for this special knowledge. Folks, okay, there it is. Now, you could spend a lifetime trying to find the knowledge that's in there and applying it to our lives and understanding it, but um, that's where it lies. Be suspicious of those who string multiple verses together to reach their own conclusions. Yeah. You can find whatever you want in that Bible. Mm -hmm. You can find whatever you want. I know people look at this Bible and say, well, this Bible is just an evidence of the misogynistic, anti-female, uh, uh, downtrodden women, you know, no women's rights. But I know th that I can look at the scripture and I say, Jesus unfolded so many new um, appreciations for uh, females and and created uh, woman not to be a second class citizen but a a partner. So y you can see you can see whatever you want in the Bible. If you want to see gay rights, you can find it. If you want to see traditional morality, you can find it. If you want to see uh, worshiping God through nature, you'll find it. Just pick pick the right verses out of context, and you can get your whole brand new religion or denomination. Right. Um, so here's my rule. I just made this up. It's not, I've never heard anybody else say it, but I think there's some truth to it. If you find, because I've, I've heard this, and somebody will get up here and they'll say, okay, here's this main verse, and then I want to go back and, and tell you this other verse that connects to it, and then there's this other verse that connects to that, and then there's this other verse connects to that, and therefore uh, cats have nine lines. <laughs> If, if, you hear, if you see that Bible fluttering, not, not validating a verse based on relevant verses, because um, that's one of the things I'm avoiding in this study of Revelation, um, because there are hundreds, literally hundreds of references to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. You will not fully understand Revelation unless you have read and have an understanding of the Old Testament uh, from, from the beginning because it's, it, it's the end of one whole story, right? So um, I'm not saying that we don't have lots of references. And if you have a footnote Bible, um, I was, who was it I was kind of teasing about their big print Bible? Was that Tanya, I think, was, has this big print Bible? Uh, I, I need to get one. Because I can read the regular print, but to see all of these marginal references here and then the footnotes at the bottom, I have, they may be in Greek, I don't know. Because I, I, can't, I can't read them. Um, but, so, 
the scholars have, have given me all of these Old Testament references, and, and that's one thing. But if I'm if I have a point that I want to prove, all right, and, that, and that's where the bad theology is. I have a point I want to prove. I'm going to go find a scripture that kind of validates that point, and then I've got to find another scripture that kind of obscurely validates that point. And when I'm three or four verses in to make a human point, I have lost any dignified theology. Yeah. All right. No. So I'm just saying, be careful about that. Now. Now, if, if somebody's flipping through and giving you all kinds of uh, other biblical references to, to validate a point that's already in Scripture because Scripture endorses and validates Scripture, that's one thing. But if somebody's chasing a rabbit and they've got to go through all these different verses to kind of get there, probably not something that they should have begun to begin with. And obviously measure every claim against the Bible. And reject extra biblical texts that claim to add truth. Yeah. Right. This, these 66 books um, have been providentially preserved and, and bound together to be a Bible that's reliable. You'll find other gospels out there. You'll find other ancient writings. You'll find other other philosophers. Other philosophers. You'll find other um, new revelations, companion book to the Bible. There are no um, anything that does not endorse, validate, or that conversely contradicts Scripture is not a sacred text. Okay, and in those denominations uh, or religious traditions where somebody in power, whether it be a pope or a denominational president, and that um, it's believed that they have new revelations and they can re-evaluate the rules and reinvent the rules. Um, we, we do not trust anything that does not come from the Bible or does, is not consistent with Scripture. All right? Now, I can say that without stomping on anybody else's belief, um, but if it's offensive, then we call that conviction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to move to the next thing, and I've labeled it protecting yourself from toxic relationships. The, the psychology of the world will tell you that if somebody is not encouraging, building you up, validating you, uh, then you need to get them out of your life. Get rid of those toxic relationships. I'm not, that's not what I'm preaching about today. Um, I'm, I'm talking about those relationships that are um, so unhealthy, right? In, in the counseling world, when somebody presents a problem, we ask the question, is it a problem? Does it affect you, if, does it affect you adversely in your finances, in your physical health, in your relationships, in your employment, or um, with the law, right? And if, if it's affecting you adversely in any of these areas, at least any of these areas, then it's a problem that needs to be resolved. So in the same way, the relationships that we're in can have uh, a negative effect on us instead of us having a positive effect on them. So we need to have discernment. Uh, and I'm going to throw up some human wisdom here and then I'm going to show you the scriptures. We need discernment about how to manage relationships that may not be uh, godly or in our best interests. Okay, So I'm not the among the Facebook crowd that says, um, if people don't agree with you, then, then get rid of them. Right? And you see these posts. I'm not a Facebook addict, but I do watch it. And you'll see people say, well, if, you know, if you disagree with this, then just unfriend me. All right, well, that's a marvelous way to manage relationships, right? No. Um, and we do not expect non-Christian people to behave in Christian ways, right? Why are we shocked when unbelievers act like unbelievers? Why do we have to throw up a protest sign because somebody's acting like an unbeliever? So the question is, what is the nature of our relationship? Um, have you ever heard the term missionary dating? 
One of the things that I, that I observed when I was a young person and watching people in the dating world that I was pretty much separated from um, is that some Christian girls would be perfectly fine dating unchristian young men because maybe they could be a good influence on them. That's missionary dating. We do not missionary date. We don't hang out with somebody all the time uh, in a close and intimate relationship uh, with the idea only that I'm going to convert them. Now, again, if the Lord leads you to be in relationship with somebody of some sort of friendship, then, then that's another thing. So I'm not, right, I'm, not, I'm not painting a black and white picture. I'm just saying um, here's some things to ask yourself about somebody that is, is not, maybe not a good influence on you. Um, I know a young couple who was contemplating divorce and um, the young woman said to me, well, everybody I talk to says, I've got to make myself happy that my kids will be fine. They'll, they'll know that adults can make decisions and get along even if there's conflict. And just all of this list of reasons why divorce was a perfectly fine thing. And I was like, please, 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 no. Because you can find people that would agree with whatever you want yeah. to be said and validated. Right. And that marriage is still intact, I am very pleased to say. Do you tolerate them far beyond your moral comfort? How much tolerance do, do you have for somebody who is not a good influence on you? And if, it's, if you know that you're around them when they're doing the wrong thing. There are, there are Christians who, because they are Christians, think that they have to do everything that somebody asks them to do, otherwise they're not Christians. Somebody asked me to take some dope from here to there, and, and I, I just, you know, I'm a friend of theirs, I don't want to ruin the relationship, and, and I'm a Christian, so I'll do that for them. No. <coughs> Do you tolerate them far beyond your moral comfort? Are you frequently making excuses for their behavior? Mm -hmm. Well, that's just him. That's just the way we are. Yeah? Where was I? Do you use them to explain or excuse your own bad behavior? Well, do you? Now, if you're not thinking about yourself, think about somebody else who has relationships that are not healthy, that are destructive. Do they mock you or block you from doing what you know is right? So do you avoid doing the right thing or saying the right thing so that you don't offend them and they are actually being a negative influence on you rather than you being a positive influence on them. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We're living as salt and light as followers of Christ. We do not have to throw out the four spiritual laws to everybody that we meet. Now, if you're gifted that way, you have the gift of evangelism and, and you feel the Holy Spirit moving you that way, then you can be one of those people. I know people that say, every conversation I have, I know how to turn that into a gospel conversation. And that's wonderful. I don't have that gift. I'm not trying to make an excuse for myself. But here's what I think. Every conversation I have, God has the opportunity to turn that into a gospel conversation. Mm -hmm. sure. And the more we look for that, the more we'll see it. Right? And that's why I like these little things. The little uh, magnets and the coins and the business cards and the, and the books and pamphlets. Those kinds of things. Give you an opportunity. But sometimes people put up with outright mocking. Here's a big one. Do they misuse judge not and insist you are wrong to reject them? Yeah. My favorite t-shirt is the one in big block printing that says, only God can judge me. And every time I see that, I think, and me. Because if you're walking around living in the liberty of expecting no one to judge you or hold you accountable for your behavior... That's not what Matthew 7 is about. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you. Right. 
Because the verses that I'm going to show you here momentarily are all about judging character, making assessments, and making determinations. So that judge not passage needs to be very carefully studied in context so that we understand it is not a prohibition about making judgments. I have to use this substance because uh, I'm depressed and it gets me out of my depression. Don't judge me. All right, I'm not going to judge you beyond... Uh, the, 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 the way that I expect. I'm just going to say, I just want you to know who Jesus is. Yeah. And, and, and then the rest of your life will be lived in the context mm-hmm. of your relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Those other things can be worked out. I'm not going to try to alter your gender identity, your sexual preference, your recreational behavior, any of that. I might give you some caution flags. I might give you some some sound advice, and I might encourage you to do some some better things. But my number one concern for the unbeliever is the fact that they're an unbeliever. Amen. I am not going to try to make them into a, a a morally right person, and then expect them to jump from that to accepting Christ. Yeah. Because the first step is accepting Christ, and the, then we spend a lifetime conforming ourselves. To who he is. And uh, maybe that can be instantaneous and maybe it's uh, over a long struggle. We like those instant conversions where we're delivered from drugs, we're delivered from alcohol, we're delivered from immoral living, we're delivered from bad relationships, we're, we're delivered from, from uh, depression. We really like those fast conversion experiences. But you know what? Uh, we learn more slowly working through what God wants us to learn than we do from immediate healing, right? I'm all for immediate healing. That's my vote. (laughs) But if you're hearing this, oh, you can't judge me. You know what your answer to that is? Oh, yes, I can, right? And if you're confused about that, study Matthew 7, context. Okay, now, enough old man Schultz wisdom. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. I know your mom told you this. It is true. Bad company corrupts good character. You know, I often hear things like... um, how sports builds character. And there's a, there, this is one of these sayings that is attributed to everybody from um, Caesar Augustus to Abraham Lincoln, you know, on Facebook. Um, but, but I like the saying that sports don't build character, they reveal character. Right? So um, it, if. So make sure that your character is revealed and maintained. Proverbs, walk with the wise and become wise, for the companion of fools suffers harm. All the motivational speakers will tell you, you find somebody that is the kind of person you'd like to be, and you hang out with that person. But many of us, I'm going to draw a circle around myself, many of us like to hang out with people that are lesser than us so that we can feel like we're better than they are. All right, now I put a human spin on this scriptural truth, so you stick to the Bible here. <laughs> Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Oh. All right. Find people of good influence, of good character. Now, is that way we stay, did we stay away from sinners? We stay away from unbelievers? No, our mission is to the world. It is to a corrupt world. And sometimes that means uh, operating within a relationship. A man, can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Do you think he can hang out with a knucklehead and not get a little knucklehead in this world? No. No. Again, First Corinthians, but now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister but is sexually immoral or greedy and an idolater or slanderer A drunkard or a swindler do not even eat with such people. Paul is talking about associating with someone who claims to be a believer but in no way acts like a believer. Or acts like they can have a foot on both paths. Mm -hmm. 
Because really what they're saying, whether they're labeling themselves or not as Gnostic or not, what they're saying is, what I do in my flesh doesn't make that much difference. I'm still a good Christian. No, if the word Christian means Christ-like, then no. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone mm -hmm. in the house. And so my little parenthetical thought there as I read this is, are your friends and associates, those people that have to spend time with you, are they a shadow or a light? Um, what do they do to the candle that is your light in the world, to the, to the saltiness of your Christian faith? What influence do they have? on that. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered. You may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. <laughs> Let me tell you about negative emotions. Mm -hmm. They're worse than COVID. Mm -hmm. You can catch it. Yeah. Yeah. You can catch their anxiety. You can catch their grouchiness. You can catch their depression. You can catch their uh, anger. Again, I'm not saying that you need to stay away from those people, but um, think about this term, dosage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How much brain space, how much time um, am I devoting to this person who exerts a negative influence, influence on my life? If your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter the life of enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Mm -hmm. Can we say if your relationship causes you to stumble? Cut that relationship off. Mm -hmm. Now you might want to pray, Lord, I've got to dissociate uh, myself from this person. Would you bring some believer into their life yeah. so that they can find the light of Christ? We're not casting them off to hell. We're not washing our hands and saying, well, you made your decisions, although there may be a point where that um, needs to happen. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteous and wickedness have in common? What do fellowship, what do, can fellowship, can light, what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and uh, Belial or Satan? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Now, this yoking, this is a partnership. We're talking marriage. And if you want some testimonies about uh, people that have yoked with unbelievers, we can generate some of those. Um, I think this probably extends into businesses, business partnerships as well, and other types of really close, close-knit, yoked together, bound together relationships. It's just some good common sense that Paul is throwing out there. Don't yoke together. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. This is the New Testament. This is not the Old Testament. Right? A divisive person. Now, one of my responsibilities as shepherd um, and your responsibilities as church members is if somebody comes into this congregation and they begin to be divisive, they begin to teach some kind of tidbit of truth about the way that we ought to worship or the way we ought to understand Jesus or the way we ought to express our faith and that is not biblical, then we have the absolute right to break fellowship with them. Okay? That seems like a harsh teaching and it seems like a, a non-Christian thing. Oh, we're supposed to love everybody. We're supposed to embrace everybody. We're supposed to... We're supposed to uh, embrace this diversity of thought. We're supposed to be tolerant of anything, right? Yes, we are supposed to be loving. We are supposed to recognize that everybody that we have a conflict with is somebody for whom Jesus died and wants to be in heaven with you for eternity. But what Jesus said here, he used the word tolerate. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. You put up with stuff that is in my church that should not be in my church. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so the issue of tolerance goes along with this misapplication of judge not. 